Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of Deep Cuts. Um, I'm your host, Antoine Reed, and today's guest is somebody who, again, just like on Tuesday, is who I would call an OG. So they were on the first version of Deep Cuts when we were uh, on Instagram Live and trying to figure out what in the world was going on in the world with the pandemic. And now they have uh, decided graciously to subject themselves to this again. So I'm very excited to talk to this person. Um, so our guest today is Bradley Rubin from Alec and Brad, Alec Bradley Cigars and Alec and, and Bradley. And we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff. And we have a lot to catch up on. Um, so let's just bring on our guests. Mr. Bradley, how are you? Mr. Antoine, uh, I got to say that I don't think anyone in this industry has ever referred to me as an OG. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if I can meet the age requirements to be considered an OG, but I appreciate uh, that. I know it's because I was on the first season of Deep Cuts, but I appreciate you referring to me as an OG. That's very kind. Well, I told, I told Michael Herklotz that on Tuesday, too, because, you know, when, when we first when I first thought I always referred to myself as we, I guess, me and my different personalities that are fighting for a uh, dominance these days is uh, when I was first doing Deep Cuts, I had no idea what, what I was doing. And I just remember people were like, you should do something. You should do something. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I'm a kind of a behind the scenes kind of person. And then uh, you and your brother were one of the first people I was like, man, who would I want to talk to? Because <laughs> that's what it's all about. It's like, it's not about like, you know, there's no agenda here. It's like, who would I, I actually feel like talking to? And I was like, you know, I was like, those two are two people I can easily talk to. And it was such a, a strange and wonderful time that we, when we spoke. And this is crazy that it's been, that was 2020. And here we are <laughs> uh, in 2022. So thank yeah. you again for like subjecting yourself to this all over again. <laughs> hey, anytime, anything for you. Uh, it's, it's a way for us to connect with people and, and uh, you know, with COVID happening and us having to resort to this instead of traveling, it's made it a lot easier as well to connect with people virtually. So I'm always happy to, to do these and especially for you. Oh, thank you so much. So yeah. what's been going on with you? Like I said, last time we, we, we did this, it was 2020. We were trying to uh, fit ourselves onto a little phone screen with Instagram Live. And I remember we were talking about uh, Tiger King, so which just seems like, <laughs> seems yeah. like cr a crazy amount of time, like eons ago now. Uh, so what's been going on with you since then? So, uh, Honestly, travel has just recently uh, just ramped up again for me. You know, now things are seemingly getting back to normal and people want to do more in-person events. And um, even though this has been an easy, easy way to connect, that's the, the best way that we like to connect is in person and talking to people. So, you know, we saw each other at TPE uh, in, in January. Mm -hmm. um, where was I? I was in Pittsburgh and Ohio and Kentucky um just now, uh, recently in february and then this upcoming week i'll be traveling in florida um so it's all picking back up again um it's really nice to see everyone and and uh just see everyone's faces and and try and you know speak about the good brand that is that is alec bradley yeah and, and do you think because i know since you're we're i guess in in some type of age bracket where we might be close to each other <laughs> I might be a bit older um, these days. I'm, I'm pretty sure I am with from most people. But do you think like we're starting to get into like a hybrid mode of digital online stuff and in person? Or do you think the industry is kind of shifting back to more heavily just on the in person stuff? I think it's kind of shit. Um, I think mainly it's shifting back to in person, um, you know, just due to the nature of our business and the, the demographic, we are a very, you know, an older demographic when it comes to the, the industry. So uh, not a lot of people are in tune with, you know, technology and, and doing it all. And it, and it is a lot, especially if you're doing it on a large scale. So like recently I just did the great smoke um, for smoke in and they did a uh, last year, they did only virtual, but this year is virtual as well as um, an in-person event. So, you know, that's someone who's catering to both sides of, of, you know, the market people that can't come to the event, but still want to be involved. So I think there's some people that will do the hybrid, but I think the majority you'll see going back solely to in person. 
Yeah, and I kind of like having the option of both, so like what Great Smoke did, because there's sometimes when you just can't, you can't physically get to places. <laughs> it's just not, it's not possible. You have work obligations, you have family obligations. It's just, if right. it's in another state, I mean, you have to do the hotel stuff, and especially with things right now with gas prices and everything going up, it's just not feasible. So I like the, the option of having both and being able to take part in some stuff virtually if you can't make it, um, even though obviously the in-person is a completely different experience because, you know, like when I saw you in January at, at the trade show, it was, you know, it was like, oh my gosh, it was like, it was like virtual reality. It's like, they're real, like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, we're, we're not like on the screen anymore and we're not in a box. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and even, you know, there's some people that, you know, parts of the country that we never get to go to or it doesn't make sense for us to go to. So, you know, still doing these gives people the ability to still see us or kind of meet us in a way that they still interact and get to know who we are. So it's always important that we I think that we still have these in the future, like, you know, <clears throat> interviews and Zoom interviews and virtual herfs should always stick around because there's always going to be people that don't get that in-person interaction. So it's very, it's still very important. Exactly. Now, before we get to the Alec Bradley, you know, everything going on with your company and your family and such like that, I remember being at TPE and everybody was talking about your new look. <laughs> like, how did that feel? Just <laughs> it, It's been like that for a long time. This is, um, so I did the mustache in February of 2020. So it's been a while now, but what I recently did, and, and it's kind of hard to see because I I didn't know how it was exactly going to come out, but I went to my barber after, you saw my hair back at TPE and it was very long and it still is long, but I went to the barber and I asked him to give me like a mullet. So he didn't, he I, honestly was like, what do you, what is that? So I had to like show him <laughs> pictures and being like, you know, you're going to shave the sides and like, then you're going to keep my hair long in the back. And and so we worked on it together. It's a little bit longer still up top than what I was hoping for. But I, I did go to my barber and say, or a new barber and say, I, I want you to give me a mullet. So I've come to the point where I don't know if I'm losing my mind and <laughs> or, or I'm just doing this out of the amusement for, for everyone else. But I think I'm just trying to have fun and kind of be myself and I don't know, act a bit of a fool just to, you know, just to have a good time. Well, I like it. It reminds me of uh, Super Mario. So <laughs> very original, Antoine. Come on, it does. Yeah. And you know, today is today is March tenth, which is I don't know if you know this, but in the video game world, it's Mario Day. No, you're you know, are, are you are you serious? I'm dead serious. M A R one zero. It's Mario Day, and I kid you not. And I don't know. We you set me up. You set. No, me up. I didn't. I just like. I thought about this earlier today because, like, I, I kid you not that this is a real thing. It's Mario Day. It's like if you go to Best Buy, if you go to uh, Nintendo store online, it's a whole day that, that Nintendo created. And it's it's a big thing. And here you are on the show. So, <laughs> so we get we get to have this, like, special time together uh, as, as Mario Day. And it just makes me, when I look at you, I can just hear... I don't know if, if you watched the old like 80s show with a wrestler who was Mario, but you know, he used to come on the screen and it was like, it's the Super Mario Brothers Super Show. And then they used to have like a theme song. So uh, I don't want to get into copyright things, so we're not gonna play the theme song, but <laughs> it's a good it's a good it. I, oh my I can't believe I fell into that. Like there was all these dates available and I had to pick March 10th Mario Day to come on. You did. It was awesome. It was awesome. I just wanted to highlight that because it is a special day as somebody uh, I took, you know, people, they can't see, but, you know, I have my little Nintendo Switch over there and stuff. So it's always a big day. Um, so this is how I'm celebrating with having a Mario lookalike uh, on the show today. So. <laughs> so switching gears away from that, you know, to the cigars, like let's let's talk about because I think the last time you were on here, like like I said, <coughs> time, it was 2020. We're right in the middle of the pandemic. There's lots of stuff that I think you all were working on that you kind of had to put the brakes on a little bit because you didn't want to, I think like you and other companies, it was like, what do we do? Like, do we release stuff now? And does it get lost in the fold? Like retailers were shutting down. They were opening. They were trying to do curbside. It was all this stuff going on. So um, 
what's been going on with you late with you all lately because i know you have released some new stuff um are things kind of getting back to a pre-pandemic normal like routine for you all yeah um it is and and while that sounds good uh it still lends us to uh, uh we have plenty of issues like when it's not the pandemic and hitting timelines and being you know everything like you hope everything works out you're like well if i get it done this day then the bands will be ready and the boxes and the blends and everything will be perfect but it never ends up perfect so you always have to be ahead of schedule to get to the actual time that you want the cigar to be released so we've had a lot of stuff come out recently and then we also have a lot of stuff coming out soon so like we recently released um, a limited edition trilogy, which is an old, old brand that my father created back in the early 2000s, which was a triangle press cigar. And he was the first one to ever do it. And we're still the only ones to ever do it, but it got discontinued and we haven't seen it since. So everyone's been begging for years and years for trilogy to come out and we finally released it. Um, so it comes in three wrappers, the, the exotic Maduro, the native Cameroon, the authentic Corojo. And they come in these beautiful boxes that uh, look like a mold, look like the mold from the factory, because it is such a special and unique product um, of a triangle press cigar. So we really wanted to highlight that this is something that is unique to us, that we're the only ones that do it and you're not going to find it anywhere else. So that came out um, maybe like four months ago, something like that. Um, not a, I don't exa exactly remember, but. I was, I was really, really happy with how the, not just how the cigars turned out, but how the packaging came out as well. Yeah. And, and I think in a few minutes, we're going to get into like all the recent releases. Cause I, I went through and at first, you know, when I was thinking about this interview earlier, I was like, cause I know you all are kind of, I don't, I don't want to say conservative, but there are some companies that it seems like every other month it's like, here's a new something, here's a new something, here's a new something. And you can barely keep track of all the new stuff and it seems like it gets lost but i know you all are, are take a, a slightly different approach it seems like which i like and it's like you release stuff but it's not you know you don't overwhelm the consumer with all the stuff you want them to focus on your core products and your core portfolio mm -hmm. and then there's some special stuff that comes out you know throughout the year so you all have a, a completely different to market strategy that i think is very generous to the consumers because it's like i said you have some new stuff that comes out but you're also are not trying to overwhelm people in the industry by saying like look how many how much stuff we can release in a year yeah yeah you know that's that's we want people uh you know to smoke our our core brands and you know not have to be always be excited about new stuff and then we have our our seasonal um releases every year so um you know we do a limited edition filthy hooligan and shamrock um in march and then usually we'd have the diamond press so it used to be the nicopuro diamond press and now it's the black market s lee diamond press so again another shaped cigar that only we do um and then usually in november or december we have fine and rare come out but because of the issues of covid and things not being ready on time we missed this past year's release for for fine and rare in november december and now it will be coming out in april so to to backtrack a little bit um, what were your father's motivations for starting a cigar company? Because it seems like every time I speak to people on here, I always ask towards the end, you know, like, what's your advice to somebody who might want to get into the industry or whatever? And usually the, the advice is don't. <laughs> so it's always like, it's, it's always, you know, it's not exactly the easiest industry to get into and then have success in. But yeah. with your company, you've been around for, a very long time so obviously your father and this you all you, you and your brother and everybody else who works at the company has have found a way to make this work um and to make it you know work for you all and work for the consumers and the retail partners who are also a big part of it so what were his motivations have or whatever he he told you were the motivations for for starting this company um so from what I've been told, you know, the, the so he started the company in, in 1996. So we just had our 25th anniversary and he started the company only a year after I was born and obviously named the company after me and my older brother, Alec. And part of the reason that he said uh, two reasons why he named it after me and Alec was that 
Um, you know, he never like wanted to fail with, you know, his, his kids names on the company. You know, there was, he had a lot of pride in, in naming it Alec Bradley after us. And um, he wouldn't want to see, you know, our names, cons- you know, kind of fail in that, in that regards. So instead of naming it Alan Rubin cigars or Rubin cigars, um, well, he also said he wouldn't name it that because it, you know, we're, we're Jewish and um, it doesn't exactly have the best ring in a, you know, heavy, heavy, uh, you know, Hispanic market, but <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, his motivation I think was always us and his family, you know, just uh, wanting to provide. And my father, my father sold my grandfather's company. They did nuts and bolts and screws. And my father at some point took over his company um, and sold it. And then when trying to figure out what he wanted to, wanted to do, um, everyone really just said, Hey, you, you like cigars a lot. Like you come in into work smoking every day, you smoke on the weekends. Like maybe that's something you should consider doing. And he kind of was like, okay, like, yeah, I think that sounds like a pretty good idea. And, um, you know, he started after the the nineties boom. Um, so he didn't really get any part of that, of that ride to give him a boost, but he became creative in, in ways that he needed to be. So coming out with, with trilogy, you know, got a lot of eyeballs on him as just as a brand. Um, one of his, biggest successes in something that we still make today is a brand, a bundle brand called Occidental Reserve, which is made at Davidoff. Um, another brand which we still have is Max. Uh, when he first came out with Max, he sold every cigar for five dollars for five dollars at retail. Didn't matter if it was a, a Robusto or an, didn't matter if it was a Churchill. And people would ask, like, why, why would you do that? Like there's supposed to be different, you know, price points. And he's like, well, because I can. And he thought that that was a cool marketing piece that would get people interested in the in the brand, and they can have the you know biggest cigar they want for five dollars. So, I've I've noticed that he's always looking for something unique and different in an industry that is otherwise you know not really evolving very quickly, you know, not changing, and you know we're a very traditional industry. Um, so his ability to be unique and creative has is what I think has been a huge success of our company. Yeah, and you all have your own factory. Do do you or do you not? No, we do not. We do not have our own factory. So we uh, we work with two factories in Honduras, uh, two in Nicaragua, and one in the Dominican Republic. And I think it's the Honduras factory. I must see a lot of or or hear a lot about. So obviously, making cigars in different countries, this kind of provides you with a portfolio of completely different products. So like, what I always ask people this because. I think whenever I talk to non-cigar smokers or or c- cigar aficionados, if you want to call them that, they they none of them know when that when I like if I'm in the lift going to the airport to go to a cigar event, I tell them and they're like, oh, you know, they think all cigars are made in Cuba still, and I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I tell them that it's like it, it, there are some that are made in Honduras, there's some that are made in Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and that's like blows their mind because they have like no concept. So like in terms of like Honduras, like what does each country kind of give the cigar? Like, is it anything different really? Or is it just, you know, is it like a different flavor profile? Is it just a different experience or is it kind of all the same, just made, you know, different setting? Um, it's, it's honestly, it's, it's going to sound like such a bad answer. It's everything. Like there's so many different variables. The main variable being, you know, where's the tobacco, what's the tobacco seed? and and where is it grown you know those those are the main variables but then every factory you know maybe does things different when it comes to the processing of the tobacco and then how do they roll the tobacco what does you know what do they teach at one factory compared to what do they teach at another factory so it it uh it allows for a complete wide range of of cigars and like you said different profiles but it doesn't mean you know uh, something that I think is a huge misconception of cigars is, yeah, hey, I, like, I, uh, this is a Dominican cigar. You know, this comes out of the Dominican Republic. Well, what's the makeup of the cigar? Well, it's uh, it's all it's an all Nicaraguan cigar. So it's an all Nicaraguan cigar, but it's deemed a Dominican cigar because it's produced in the right. Dominican Republic. But all the tobacco that you got for it all comes from Nicaragua. So that's something that I think as a as a 
industry, we can do a better job to help explain to our customers and our consumers is, is yeah, you know, this may be a Dominican cigar um, and you may not like it, but it's all Nicaraguan tobacco. So learning more about, you know, what the tobacco, where the tobacco comes from and what the, what the tobacco is and, you know, what factories are being produced that, you know, maybe you like uh, a certain factory that makes certain cigars, you know? So the more that we can explain to our consumers about each individual cigar, I think it's overall beneficial to, to our industry. Now for you, were you always, as a child, I know most uh, sons kind of yeah. admire their fathers, uh, unless you have a really bad relationship with them, which I know you didn't. Um, so um, and were, were you always like thinking that at some point you were going to get into the business? Was your father thinking that? Because I would think it's it sort of a gamble like, what if he named it after you and your brother? And then you all were like, I hate cigars. Like <laughs> what, what plot twist that would have been. Um, yeah. To, yeah. To, I've, to turn around and be like, don't ask them if they actually like cigars. It was <laughs> just a motivator for me. Yeah. He never, he never pushed us. He never said, you know, that we should join or that we have to, or anything like that. Um, so I think when I was probably in high school, I would ask him a lot of mainly questions just about business and how he tends to handle things, um, but not so much about the cigar industry. And then when I turned 18 and when I went up, went to college, um, I started smoking cigars and it became, you know, a hobby of mine in college. And I made a lot of friends, um, you know, because of it, people I'm, I'm still very close with that I smoke cigars with. Um, but it, when it came to me graduating, um, I kind of mentally made the decision that this is what I want to do. Um, but I guess I hadn't, I hadn't verbally explained to anyone in my family uh, that that was what I was planning on doing. So it was like a few months before graduation and they're like, Hey, Bradley, um, like, what do you think? What do you think you're going to do for work? And I'm like, Oh no, I'm, I'm going to join Alec Bradley. And they're like, Oh really? And I was like, yeah, I, I told, I told you that. And they're like, no, you didn't. So it, it came to, to quite the surprise to, I think my whole family, um, and then, uh, and then just a, a few months later after graduation, I, I joined right before, uh, about two weeks before IPCPR. Uh, and it, you know, definitely opened my eyes as to really what the whole industry was about. Cause I was really at that point, just a cigar smoker. I didn't, re I didn't really know too much about cigars and tobacco or much of the business. Um, so it really emerged me into the industry pretty quickly. Yeah, I always like to ask people that, like, what was that transition like going from just being a cigar smoker to suddenly working in the industry? Because I would imagine it's it's not easy. It's not like you just wake and go. It's like it's like I know everything now. It's like was there was that transition easy for you, or was it like every week you were just like, oh wow, this is shocking? It was everything I was learning was shocking. Like. My dad wanted me to, to go basically go around the office and and you know, every couple of weeks and learn what accounting accounting does. And I'll never be able to learn what accounting does. But <laughs> right. learn what accounting does, you know, help uh, ship in the back and look what their process looks like from, you know, working with inside sales and then inside sales with how they work, communicate with our reps. So everything was was uh, extremely difficult to learn just how the whole business operates. And then also starting to learn about tobacco and and you know the process of making cigars and then going down to my first trip and seeing the factories and getting explained everything to you and then you leave and you're like man i like there was so much information i need to go back to just learn so and i and i still feel like i still feel that way that i don't know very much about um the tobacco side of things but i i quickly started to find what i liked to do and what i wanted to do at alec bradley which was creating brands because i I know that that's what I love as, as a cigar smoker. And I want to be able to give that to people that smoke our cigars or, or ha don't smoke our cigars, but are interested um, and create, you know, just the creation of, of brands is a fun way for people to kind of get to know who we are. Yeah. And, you know, so your favorite part of this job is creating the, the brands. And I know you said that you had to kind of, work your way up to that point though. It's not like you just came in and said, dad, I'm going to do this. And he was like, sure, like go in there and do it. It was like, yeah. you had to kind of earn your way. But I found like there's a lot of people in the, in the industry 
like a class um, Kellner who was the same way, who had to kind of work his way through the factory before he got to where he is with this, you know, um, with his father's company. So uh -huh. do you think, do you think without having gone through the ranks that you would be prepared to like handle the branding part, like where you are now? Or do you think it was like a necessary kind of progression? Like you had to go through that, those jobs. Oh, oh I, I definitely had to go through it. Cause like also, you know, a big part of my job is traveling and, and going into cigar shops. So I'm, you know, I'm always looking at what other people are doing and, you know, why do they do things and you know certain bands or, or packaging that i really like um i try to keep an eye on everything and also working with my dad he's always the ones the, he was always the one that created the brands you know it was always his vision and working with our graphic designer and creating the, the brand so getting to sit in with him and see what he's looking at you know down to the fine details of of every little thing that's printed on you know like a, a for this is a big band but um you know like an, an inch long band and you have to convey so much in such little space so everything that you put on there matters a lot um so just getting to sit by him and learn from him and what he's always looking for and he still catches me on things where you know i present this something that i'm working on to him and he's like that's wrong that's wrong like why did you do that here and if you don't have a good reason like you better change it and whole and i'm like he'll he'll just tear the whole thing apart and i'll be like so did you like anything about it and he's like no it looks nice and i was like well <laughs> and you know, it's like you don't like it and he's like well you gotta fix those things and i was like okay so it's he's so analytical so quickly that you know i, I try my hardest to make it perfect before he can tear it apart and i, I still have yet to do that but um you know i'm, I'm getting there I think that's the plight of any creative person though. Like if you're in any creative job or position, you always spend all this time working on something and then you have to present it to somebody and it could have taken you months, weeks, days, whatever span of time, years sometimes to work on something. And then in 10 seconds, somebody goes like, don't like that part or it doesn't make sense. So you're just like, I want to strangle you. Like how dare you? But then you got to go back and you go, okay, I can make it better. And, it, it ends up so I, I definitely understand what you have probably gone through <laughs> some of those situations where it's just like it's just part of the the creative process is the the feedback that you yeah might get. yeah and you know we want everything to be as as good as it can be when we finally release it we don't want you know people you know people are always going to be critical of, of what you do but when we're when we put out a brand and we know that we put our all into it and you know, did we plan on releasing it three or six months earlier? Yes. But are we happy with, with the outcome? 100%. You know, like, like you know, we were creating Kintsugi in the middle of the pandemic. And we probably worked about six months on, on artwork. And, you know, my dad kind of came in my ear and, you know, talked in my ear a little bit and was like, hey, I think you should reconsider, you know, the artwork on this. It doesn't really work with what you're I think what you're trying to accomplish and i spent a lot of time thinking and looking at it and i had to go to alec and say hey i think we need to start from scratch this you know yeah i think dad is right and he's like no you know i think we gotta <laughs> move forward and we gotta get the brand out we gotta move you know we gotta move on this like right now and i was like alec like trust me i, I think dad is right and like let's let's look at it and you know give me some time and you know, let's see if we can make this what it should be. And, you know, we spent another six months on it, but I think the outcome was so it was definitely worth um, all that effort and time because I think it's it's beautiful. And it's like my pride and joy seeing people smoke the cigar and even come talk to me about the packaging and, you know, the meaning behind Kintsugi and that they know the story. And that's that's everything. You know, that's that's the stuff that makes me happy. And I'm it. it you know, makes this job enjoyable to hear those words from people. Yeah, and, and with Kintsugi, I mean, that's one of the cigars that have stood out to me because, you know, I think I posted it a couple weeks ago on my Instagram that, you know, I had tried it and, you know, it, I mean, the artwork stands out. I mean, the cigar stands out too, but to me, part of, I'm a visual person. So 
like, and I'm not a, a cigar aficionado where I can pick out all the different notes in the cigar and stuff like that. So I'll look at stuff like the visual aspect of it and it makes it, if it was in a humidor with all these other things, it would stand out because the band is longer than usual. It's a completely different color scheme. You know, you don't have like the traditional cigar artwork on it that people would expect. So I think you take, you take a completely different approach to it and thinking about what that story behind it, because once you know the story behind it, it does like, you go like, wow, like that's a completely different experience. So I'm sure it's, it's probably a challenge for you. Like, how can I make this, you know, visually stand out, make it, you know, make it fit with the blend, but also give it a cool story. So it's not just us trying to push a product and, and make money from it. Exactly. You know, people, you know, people attach to stories and, and, and is it a part of marketing? Yeah. But it's also part of, you know, who we are and what we're, what the things that we like or that have meaning to us. So, you know, everyone that puts out a cigar is a reflection of, of who they are and maybe what they're interested in or like things that they like. So, you know, have, have your brands, you know, truly reflect who you are and, and what you care about. And I think that's the best, you know, the best way uh, for, you know, I don't necessarily want to say, you know, monetary success, but just, you know, your own personal success is making sure that when you put something out, it, it, it's everything that you want it to be. And, and if people like it, that's great. And if people don't like it, that's okay. You know, it's, there's cigars for everyone and not every cigar, everyone is going to love. So you can't, you can't please them all. Yeah. And I think that's a, a interesting question to kind of ask to as an offshoot of, you know, you mentioned earlier that you, your family is Jewish, obviously in the cigar industry, that's a little bit, you know, as a brand owner, it's, <laughs> I don't know how many Jewish people are in the industry. I never have gone around taking a tally, but it's a different. Uh, oh, we all know. know. We all know. <laughs> it's an inside group of, of yeah. you all, man. but it's it's diff- like you know, just coming from that different perspective. And I know that you're like the branding for Alec Bradley is is different from all the other cigar companies. Like, what kind of like. I don't know if you all do the research or try to figure out what kind of customer you all usually appeal to, but what kind of cigar smoker typically gravitates towards your company? Um, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I think kind of the, the one that gravitates to, to most, you know, that, that forties and up, you know, maybe to to sixties crowd. I think we are starting to garner a little bit of a, of a younger crowd. Um, you know, with me and Alec coming in and creating some some different looking brands for the Alec and Bradley. Um, but, you know, people that also like different and unique things, you know, we're all trying to separate our, ourselves in the industry and what makes us unique. But, you know, we we do have the, the trilogy triangle press and we do have cool packaging like Black Market and, and Magic Toast and Kintsugi and Gatekeeper and things that aren't your traditional packaging. So I think we are starting to move towards a uh, I don't want to say move towards the younger crowd, but gain uh, a younger crowd in, in our brand. Um, so, you know, and, and, and people that just know what they like and are, or want to experience new things, you know, I, I think our, our demographic is honestly forever growing because we're starting to hit different parts of the market that we haven't been for a while. Yeah. And I think maybe this is a good point to kind of go through some of your recent releases. <clears throat> Let me set that up. So we actually have visuals today, which is uh, <laughs> not typical uh, of deep cuts, but I wanted to make it special for you. Thank uh, you. And uh, I guess we could start with this one. But uh, so you all are big on St. Patrick's Day. And we were talking about this before we went live. So just talk about like why you all are big on, on that day particular and then the cigars that you created for that day. Cause I know that these come out every single year and they seem to sell out. They sell out with the retailers pretty quickly and then consumers snatch these up. The moment you see it go, go on selling the tobacconist. I mean, you're like, I better get it now. It's not one of those like, wait, it'll be there next week kind of things. So yeah. just talk about this, these two releases and St. Patrick's day and why it's important to you all. So I actually can't speak on why 
my father has chosen St. Patrick's <laughs> Day. Um, that is a question definitely for him. But this is our our now our tenth year um, doing the Filthy Hooligan. Um, only I think our third or fourth year doing the Shamrock. Our third year doing the Shamrock. Um, but originally the the Filthy Hooligan was an all Candela cigar. Um, it wasn't the barber pole for the first two years, I believe, two or three years, um, and they noticed that you know, people didn't really like the all candela. It's just, it's a very, you know, very powerful flavor. Everyone knows that it's very grassy and sweet and it just, you know, it's a, it's a odd flavor for today's market. Um, so they switched it to the barber pole and that, you know, blew up for us. Um, so we've been doing that, the, the barber pole for about seven years now. Um, and then actually for the shamrock, I think it was my second, maybe my second year at Alec Bradley. And I was told, hey, we, we created this blend. Um, it's It's got another wrapper on, on the Hooligan. You have about two months to get everything finalized for, for artwork. Because this is like I was sitting in on stuff and, and I was learning. And there I had, had voiced that this is what I want to do. And so they're like, this is going to be your first project. You're going to do, you're going to, you know, name the cigar and do all the packaging for it with our graphic designer. So that was my first uh, project was the Shamrock, the, the Filthy Hooligan Shamrock. And so it's the same same blend as the Filthy Hooligan, but it has that Habano Claro, like, you know, lighter natural wrapper on it. Um, so those are those are uh, a little bit more limited than the, the Filthy Hooligans. Okay. Let's check out fine and rare, because you were telling me when we were at the trade show that <laughs> this had originally been, like you said, m mentioned earlier in, in this interview too, originally slated to come out at one point, and then things happened, it got delayed, <laughs> and then you were like, it's finally getting ready to come out. Like, so we were like, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, finally, uh, this is now our 11th year. Uh, last year, we did a, a 10th anniversary. There was no new blend, but we did a, a chest of five different vintage years that um, we're aging for, you know, however long since each release. So this is a new one. Um, so you'll see that there's their Churchill size. Um, so you'll see on, on the left and the right, there's uh, 10 cigars total. But what you see in the center is that there's a coffin. And in that coffin is a, an undisclosed, you know, cigar, you know, that I can't talk about literally until it starts to hit shelves. Um, so that is something that people will get to see and be surprised about when it finally releases uh, in April. So the the hit also to be noted to reverse back. Um, what makes Mind and Rare special and unique to us is that every single release has 10 different tobaccos in the cigar and that only two rollers in the Rice is Connors factory, which is our that kind of main factory that you had, had mentioned earlier, Antoine. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the best two rollers in the factory get to roll these cigars. So it's been a something that for us has been very special. Um, and it's probably our, our most like anticipated release every year. Well, what I like about this is like, usually I think, you know, I know that there are people out there who like to buy boxes of cigars, but you have to really like a cigar to like at these days to, to say, I'm going to buy a whole box of them. Um, it's not, a, it's not cheap. And it, but I know it's worth it. But with this particular packaging, you know, with this mystery cigar that you get in the middle that you talked about, it makes you want to buy the box just to find out what's in the coffin. Yes. I think that's a very innovative approach to marketing and, and doing something uh, completely different with packaging than what people are used to. Giving people a reason to buy the box, not just saying, here's a box of cigars and <laughs> buy it. <clears throat> yeah, we want to we want to make things uh, fun and exciting for people. And that, like I said, my father's always been, you know, how do we make things different and unique and and get people, you know, cigars, uh, you know, cigars have been around for a long time. And, and you know, as we talked about, very traditional for the most part. So how do we how do we make cigars fun? How do we get people excited about, you know, limited edition releases and, and you know, unique marketing? It's it's all about, you know, just having people excited and, and that anticipation for cigars to, to drop and release and wanting to be the first one to, to get your hands on them. So uh, I think people are really, really going to like what's what's inside the coffin. Then we have 
trilogy. So tell us about this one. I know you told us a little bit about it, but. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you kind of the story on to how it was actually created. So um, my father in the early 2000s, uh, always good with his hands. And like I said, he, uh, my, my grandfather had a nuts, bolts and screws company. Um, so my father was always very handy. And so he had the idea for the triangle press cigar and he went to Home Depot and they had, uh, you know, they had a saw there that cut on angles and he said, Hey, can you, can you cut on these angles for me? And the guy said, yeah, absolutely. Let me, let me do that for you. So he takes it back and puts it together and, you know, sticks a cigar in there and lets it sit for a couple of weeks. And with that, he had the first triangle cigar that he made, you know, with his own mold that he made. Um, so that was the beginning of the, of the idea. And then, you know, now you got to go to the factory and say, Hey, I need you to make triangular molds for me. And they're like, you know, what do you, uh, what do you want us to do? So fast forward to now, when we were coming up with the idea and I was like, dad, like who made these cigars? Like where does anyone know where the molds are? And, uh, he's like, I think this factory has them. And we called them up and they had them and they already make cigars for us. So we wanted to, you know, try and replicate the blend. It's not the exact same cigar, but the flavor profile should be the same. And, uh, and so we, we came out with it again and, and people have been excited because it's something that's, again, it's something that's unique and different. And, and this is what, you know, this is how we want to have fun and make cigars enjoyable is, is being different. And I think like, like I said, it's such an innovative approach to it because we always think of cigars being round or torpedo shape and stuff like that. But this is triangular shape. <laughs> and it's something like I know non-cigar smokers would be like, oh, that's not a big deal. But it's I'm pretty sure like the triangle might present some, you know, it's, it's just a completely different experience uh, with the cigar. And I think knowing working with so many different companies, I know every company tries to think, how can we provide cigar smokers with a completely different experience with our product to make it memorable? So playing around with the shape of the, of the cigar is definitely innovative and believe it or in, is something that only you all have done uh, with this triangular shape. No other company has done it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's cool just because we're in an area of our own and it's something that we can always, you know, look back and say, we were, you know, we're the only ones to do this and, and that's unique to us. And, and, you know, if someone asks, you know, what's special about Alec Bradley, you know, what, what sets you guys apart? Well, we have a triangle cigar, we have a diamond shaped cigar, you know, we, we have a long list of, of things that sets us apart from the, from other companies. Um, and we, you know, we're, we're really proud of that. Yeah. And then I just have one more slide here. Let's see if, uh, so I chose this one because it's my personal favorite. <laughs> and also I know it came out, like you said, during the pandemic. So I don't think it, it I noticed that it's gotten uh, listed on many of the top 25 lists at the end of the year. Uh, it's gotten lots of recognition. So just tell us the story behind this one. Cause I think it has a really cool story. Um, especially. Yeah. Um, so this Kintsugi was something that, that I kind of stumbled upon. Uh, I think I kind of, I saw it on, on like Facebook somewhere and, and it talked about what Kintsugi was and, and that it's the, the ancient Japanese art form of, of, broken pottery being put back together with gold lacquer and that the meaning is is that your scars kind of make you who you are and that um there's there's beauty in the imperfections and that you know us as people we all have our scars and we all have our, our imperfections but that's what makes us more beautiful and i was like that's like the most touching thing i've ever heard in my life um and i and the 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 visual was was so beautiful that i was like man, I wonder maybe we could do something with this. Like, you know, I really like the idea behind it. And at the time when we were coming up with the brand and working on, on visuals, we were in a, as an industry, a very fractured, um, and you know, industry, we, you know, we saw people leaving. <laughs> our so, um, we saw people being on different sides when it came to, to regulation, you know, what's going on with the FDA and, and how to handle that and what we're all fighting for. Um, but, you know, we all have 
a passion for what we do and what we love and, and that's cigars. Um, and that's what's the gold lacquer. That's what should be bringing us together and making us you know, more beautiful is that we all have that passion and, and love for something that's so simple as, you know, some, some tobacco. And, uh, you know, it, it just was something that, um, you know, I wanted to be able to tell a story about and whether people heard about the story about, you know, the industry, or if they just learned, looked up what Kintsugi is and, and thought that story was nice. Um, I thought it was a, a nice story to tell because we we're all people and we all think about, you know, what problems we have or, you know, who we are and how do we become happier, but it, we all should be blessed with the lives that we have. And, um, you know, to come out with Kintsugi and, and receive so many, you know, accolades and people talk so highly of this brand. It's, uh, it, it's like, I'm worried that I'll never come out with anything ever again that will mean more to me than this brand because it's something that I, I constantly think about and it, it means the world to me. Well, I think, like I said, Gatekeeper was good. And <laughs> this one was like, you set the bar higher. So it's almost like, I'm sure now, like, are you working on something else to kind of try to set the bar even higher now? Or is, is the pressure there to, to create something new? Yeah, there's there's always a lot of pressure. Um, you know, right now we're just focusing on on the brands that we have. We don't we don't want to get into the rhythm of, OK, we, you know, every year we need a new brand. And that's just right. what we, we want to make sure that, you know, just like with Alec Bradley, you know, Black Market's been one of our best selling cigars for it's been, or it's been basically for 10 years now. And from what I've been learning from my father, you know, that's the foundation of of a strong brand is when people go back to your cigar time and time again. Um, and they're not always looking for what's new from Alec Bradley. So we want to make sure that we give those two cigars the attention that they deserve and that we're not just forgetting forgetting about it and moving on. But there is there really, there really is pressure personally just i don't think externally from other people there's pressure to come out with something you know better or cooler or whatever it might be but there's definitely a, a personal pressure that i i'm going to struggle to you know get an idea to come up with something that i'm going to like even more or that will be you know better or whatever it is it, it's definitely a, a scary thought because i'm only you know a few few years into this and i hope to you know, kind of do this forever. So well, what I thought was good, great about Kintsugi is like what you just touched on when you were telling us about it was that I'm sure when you were creating it and had the whole story together, it was like such a, a weird period in the industry. And it was like everybody seemed to be, it was before the pandemic even. So when all the stuff happened and then the pandemic happened and lots of stuff that we don't even need to get into with the industry, like you said, with the trade show and this and that. And it was like, so were you all just sitting there going like, let's just add a foot, an addendum to this uh, press release to, <laughs> to like put a little statement in there about, you know, a fractured, uh, a fractured industry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes and no, you know, it, it, it you know, I, I see my father who, who, you know, is constantly dealing with the fight, you know, the legislation and, and mm -hmm. FDA, you know, he spends you know, an equal amount of time, you know, 50, 50 working, and then also doing that for the industry. So seeing him have, you know, dealing with it and going through it and sometimes being frustrated about it. And then also seeing the accomplishments, you know, I could see how much it weighed on him and that it mattered to him. So there's something that I wanted to do just to put out there to the industry as to, and whether people saw it or not, like, Hey, we could all be together and, and fight moving forward together. You know, let's, you know, we, we all want the same thing for the most part. So why aren't we all on the same front? So was it a little bit of a, you know, last, I don't say last minute, but was it added? Yes. But, you know, all for, for good intentions. I think it was a bold statement to make because, you know, nobody want, wanted to at the time talk about what was going on. I mean, in a public forum, like, especially obviously behind the scenes and, you know, amongst friends and, and industry colleagues. But I mean, to make a statement like that uh, was probably pretty bold because you could easily 
I mean, it was just a minefield of trying to navigate the PR world uh, and just feelings at that time, the egos of, do I say something or do I not? But I think younger people, you know, like yourself, probably feel like, look, I have a long time in this industry. I'm going to say what I need to say and not be afraid to like, you know, not try to, you know, hold my tongue if I, I feel compelled to. So I think it was a, a good statement uh, to make and a nice way to kind of slip it in there without it being like this big to do. Um, <laughs> so Thank you. I, I think so. Um, you know, as somebody who's, who's coming up in this industry, like when you look ahead, are you excited about what you see happening in the industry? Is there something that is, is there stuff that still kind of concerns you? Because at some point you're going to be the older statesman <laughs> in the industry. Yeah. Uh, I know you're not prepared for that, but they're going to be looking back and saying like, oh, you know, like you're, you're, like, you're really an OG now. Like you're like, <laughs> you're like the next generation, uh, you know, you're, you're the old guard now. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I think I'm more excited and, and, you know, looking forward to when that time comes, because I still see, I see now with younger cigar brand, like companies and brands and also uh, retailers that, you know, they're, they are very interactive on social media and they know how to connect with their customers and put on great events. And, you know, when, like with the pandemic, when the pandemic happened, you know, making sure that people are aware that, Hey, we're doing curbside or, you know, you know, message us or call us, or we set up a, an online store where you can put your order in and we either are, are shipping now, or, you know, we'll deliver it or curbside, you know, pick your option. So I, I think the younger generation of the cigar industry is going to do so well, because I think that we're very in tune with, with marketing and, reaching out to the people that want to be reached out to and, and want to connect with us. Um, so, you know, and, you know, you, if you look at, at cigar Instagram, I mean, it's, it's blowing up, it's, it's growing every day, you know, amazing to see, you know, big brands get bigger and smaller brands that are growing, you know, it's, it's constant and people are, are becoming more and more innovative on how to connect an industry that is for the most part, you know, older, um, not as tech savvy, um, but again, they're still they're not the they're still catching those those consumers because they know that they you know are on Facebook. You know, Facebook mm -hmm. is is usually for a bit of an older crowd, but they do both. They do Facebook and they do Instagram. So it's it's really good to see that that all these companies and brands and retailers are um, had are adapting to what's happened, and that will only benefit us in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, what's your advice to people who are kind of new in the industry? And I say that because we have a lot of new blood in the industry that still, believe it or not, despite FDA stuff and how hard it is to kind of like, you know, make a profit in this industry. You still have a lot of people who are just entering the industry and just starting businesses. Like, what's your advice to some of those newbies in the industry like what's your etiquette <laughs> and, and how, how can they manage how how can they how do they need to conduct themselves and what do they need to do and you know to kind of become part of the, the big cigar family that the industry uh, is you know i don't know that i'm the best person to ask considering that you know if i wasn't in my situation i would be in their situation but you know and I think it's something that people, especially in this industry, don't necessarily, I don't know that they don't like to do, but I don't, don't want to say it's necessarily frowned upon, but like, man, marketing is, is so much, you know, it's something that people, and I think a lot of companies will say like, oh, well, like I want the cigar to, to, you know, be the, uh, the showcase that, you know, it's not about packaging. It's a, or marketing. It's just about the cigar. Is it a good cigar? Do people like the cigar? And I think that, you know, cigars are as good as ever right now, but what's going to set you apart is marketing. You know, that's what's going to, if you're a shop owner, it's what's going to get people into your store over someone else's store. If you're a brand owner, why is someone picking up, you know, your brand over another brand? Like marketing is, is so, so important. And I think it's something that can, that sometimes can lack in our industry, but it's, it makes a world of difference. Um, for you and your brand and everyone that is a part of, of your brand. 
And when you say marketing, like, what do you mean? Because I know there's some old school people in the industry who still love print. And then there's other people who think all they need is an Instagram following of a couple thousand and they're good to go. And there's other people who are just throwing their hands up in the middle who are like, I have no idea what to do. So what's marketing to you? Like, what's good marketing? Uh, it's it's uh, in, like, really, it's like engagement. You know, it's, it's you know, and it depends on the company that you want to be. If, if you're the face of the company and that's the way that you're promoting it as as you are, you know, Hi, I'm, I'm Bradley and I'm the face of Alec Bradley Cigars. People better see you. People better know who you are. You better, you know, you better be traveling. You better be on social media. So people are associating you with your brand. If you don't want it, that to be the case, you know, maybe it's more lifestyle or, you know, maybe, you know, you are all about, you know, constantly doing new releases that are that are different, you know. Like one of the brands that I fell in love with when I first started was Viaje. Viaje was doing, you know, a new brand like every month. And sometimes it's plain and sometimes it's crazy. And I love that about about his brand. And I got to meet Andre and I, I was like super excited to meet him because I liked what he did. And I thought I was creative. So it's about, you know, what are, what are your goals and what do you hope to accomplish? And then making sure that you stay on track with, you know, with what your what your goals are. So I think everyone needs to decide what what they hope to accomplish and, and just move forward. So I always like to end the show with some some type of wisdom or advice. So um, what advice do you have for, you know, since you speak so much about marketing about to marketers, like where should they get started? in coming up with a good marketing plan for their product, whether it's cigars or, or just something completely outside of the cigar world, like how should they get, get started on making up a good marketing plan and strategy? Oh man. Uh, so I would say, I mean, I, I am still learning, so I don't want to be like, you know, I'm the pro, tell, you know, <laughs> what you do, but make sure that you have a plan. Don't, don't move forward until, you know, if, if you're coming out with the new cigar, don't just, you know, come out with it and be like, all right, here it is. Now let's now let's start doing the marketing things. Let's you know, if you're getting swag made, if you're, uh, you know, social media pictures, banners, um, doing interviews, you know, make sure that that you have a full set plan and that you're executing on your plan as, you know, move it like as you're going through. Don't 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 just start, don't release a cigar and then just be like, all right, time to do all these things. Now that we release the cigar plan ahead and make sure that you're executing things as you schedule it to execute them, which is very tough to do in, in the cigar industry because nothing gets done on time ever. <laughs> so, I don't know. It's like, you know, like time, like, what are you talking about? Deadlines? What's that word? Exactly. What, what <laughs> 100%. So it's, it's the hardest part, you know, I think even for us is is being on time, but making sure that you have a plan and that you that it's everything is is how you want it to be, and you just you execute it, you know. So that's my words of wisdom, as as you would you would say. Well, I think those are great words of wisdom, and I don't think we can top those words of wisdom. So uh, I want to wrap this up by giving you the chance to, I know people who are watching this have seen this banner up most of the show, but there are going to be people who are going to be listening to this in audio form. So if they want to follow more or learn more about Alec Bradley and follow you all online, what are all the social media things that they need to follow? What's the website? How can they keep in touch with you and the Alec Bradley cigar crew? Uh, so as you see down below, Instagram, Alec Bradley Cigar, which is uh, where you'll get daily, you know, stories and about new releases and all that stuff. Uh, Facebook, Alec Bradley Cigars with an S at the end. And then Twitter is Alec Bradley. And I did not set all those up. Uh, so Antoine, I know that you're like, why are all of them just a little bit different? That's how it was when I got here. So um, that's just, <laughs> that's part you know, of it. It's, it's fun. It's like, it's funny because like once you... With social media, like once you get in there, depending on what what point of time you get in there, you, you get in there, you start typing up the name, you're like, it's taken, like that's my name, like what's going <laughs> on? 
and you're just like, oh snap, and then you have to get creative, like, okay, no S at the end, or just Alec Bradley at the end. And so it's it's one of those annoying social media things that just happens. So I completely understand. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, I know you were thinking it. You're like, wow, they all different. But you I know, like the, the the deep cuts things are all different. It's like Instagram is like deep underscore <laughs> cuts underscore live. Just yeah. because there was like the, the whole word was taken, the, the deep cuts live was taken. So I was like, whatever. But I completely understand. Like, I want to thank you for coming on. Like I told you, it was like a, a nice power hour with you. And I, I'm glad I finally tracked you down because I know you were on the road and tracking you down was like, uh, it was like trying to chase down Carmen San Diego. It was like, I was like, I'm going to get this guy eventually. I know I am. And I spoke to Jonathan. He was like, he'll get back to you next week. And I was like, I'm going to get Bradley. And I was like, looking at him, and I was like, I'm going to catch this guy. So I'm glad I caught up with you and that you found time to join us, especially on this magical day, Mario day. <laughs> so <laughs> you get to share that with your family, that it was a special Mario day and that you were on here. And um, like I said, I, I definitely learned more about you and your family every time I talk to you. And we'll have to get your father on here at some point. He has not been on Deep Cuts yet. And uh, I know that that will be a very fun interview as well. Um, he was actually one of the first people when I first, when they first let me out of the uh, graphic design cage to travel and cover people in person. He was one of the first people I encountered in 2015 when I went to the Rocky Mountain Cigar Festival. Oh, nice. And the only problem was that I had never, like the magazine I worked for at that time, for whatever reason, never did any coverage of Alec Bradley. So I was like, you know, sitting there with my little camera going up to people and just like, I remember his booth was right next to uh, Law for Dominicana. So Tony was there and I didn't know who Tony was. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't know who your father was at the time. But he yeah. quickly told me because I was like, oh, I was like, you're with Alec, Alec Bradley Cigar. He's like, uh, yeah, I was like, like, who else would I be? And I just remember going like, oh, and then it was like later on, I was like, Oh, I was like, it was like one of those things because yeah. I was not a writer at, I was not writing at the time. So obviously I should have done uh, a little bit of homework, but it was so many people there. And I remember just being out in the, the Colorado sun, just baking and just being like, what's going on? Like, this is my first time they're letting me out. And I was like, I just embarrassed myself in front of Alan Rubin, who I didn't know who he was and stuff. Yeah. So it'll be fun to have him on. Uh, to apologize and, and then also to get his side of the story because I know, like you said, he does a lot of work with uh, the advocacy part of the industry that doesn't really get spoken about because it's not the fun part <laughs> of exactly. the cigar industry, but it's a very important part. So it'll be, I'll reach out to Jonathan soon about getting uh, your father on here to talk about what he's been doing and about his, his work with your company and also with the legislation and getting things going and passed so that everybody can continue to enjoy cigars. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, thank you so much for coming on and thank you all for uh, everybody who watched this and, and is listening to this. Uh, as I always say, if you want to learn more about Deep Cuts, you can go to deepcutslive.com. Um, we try to do shows at least once a week. Uh, I have shows, two shows scheduled for the next couple of weeks, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> Who's next? Who's just coming up? So Monday we have Enrique from Matilda, um, Matilda Cigars. And then we also have uh, uh, Spencer from A Reserve. So it's a new comp newer company, but really interesting. Then I think we have Jeremy Castagli that next week after. And uh, we have, it's just so many people, like I can't even keep track of it. It's like, Jeremy Castagli, we have Brian Dezen from Provada Cigar Club, we have um, Pedro from Drew Estate, and then we, yes. we're starting to book people um, for April. So it's, it's just rolling right along. So uh, very exciting. So we have a lot of shows coming up. If you are on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, YouTube, just make sure you like, hit the follow button, hit the notification button to you'll be notified anytime we have new shows. Um, and like I said, uh, we try to do shows at least once a week and we just have fun just learning about people in the industry and, and different lifestyle industries. So we'll, we do have our first kind of non-cigar industry person guest coming up on uh, 
next month and we're going to have more of a, just expanding the lifestyle. So um, thank you again, Bradley, for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Always fun. And I uh, want to thank everyone again for watching and see you back here next week.